You know, this morning we had, and I think Tom DeWeese deserves, you know, just a huge applause for this. This morning he put together three Michaels. This afternoon he put together two Pratts. Well done. <laughs> so I get the opportunity of introducing another Mr. Pratt. This one is Stephen Pratt, and he grew up in the Backwoods Ranch, uh, in a Backwoods Branch in the state of Washington. His family was still using draft horses until he was about 12 years old. Steve graduated from Brigham Young University with a master's degree in education and did postgraduate work, and we won't hold this against him, but at the University of California in Berkeley in the 60s? Oh, my goodness. And he survived it all to come tell us something. Anyway, what is he going to tell us? Well, um, he worked for seven years under the direction of renowned historian Cleon Skousen, where he devoted his time to research and teaching in many locations in the United States and two foreign countries. With his wife, Belle Vigay, they are the parents of four children and reside on a 60-acre ranch in Cove Fort, Utah. Stephen Pratt is an accomplished craftsman and for, more, for the past 20 years has earned a living with his hands in a family business called Pratt Wagon Works, where he, his son Ben, build historic wagons, printing presses, and other old-fashioned reproductions. Please help me welcome Mr. Stephen Pratt. I'm delighted to be here. I enjoyed your presentation. We're going we're gonna to do what we do. We're going to teach the same thing twice. And when I get done using the same quotes, maybe I'll remember. <laughs> it's great. It's just great. Connecting the dots. Some months ago when this uh, theme was suggested, I started thinking about dots. And I thought, decided the title should be something about connecting dots. And so it's connecting the dots to awaken the American people. How much human misery has been caused by leaders who have been bright but bad, clever but dishonest, good but naive and unwise? Seems like all of our leaders fall into some, one of those three categories. I thought about this theme, connecting the dots, and I actually found an, a, a fantastic picture that shows exactly what's happening in America. And I got a paper punch, and I punched it full of holes, and I took all those dots and laid them on the computer screen, and I copied them, and those are the dots. <laughs> now, if you could see that picture, you would know exactly what's happening, and I wouldn't have to say any more. But I have a responsibility to take 30 minutes. So 29 more minutes to go. Connecting those dots will give us an exacting picture of what's happening in America, and in 29 minutes, we'll have them connected. June the 26th, 1945, was a big fat dot day, a creation of a dot. This is a declaration of faith that war is not inevitable, the President of the United States declared, Harry Truman, and sitting at the table in front of the United Nations group in San Francisco was Edward Stettenhaus as he signed the United Nations Charter as a representative of the United States. The supreme fraud of 1945. That's what took place on that date, June the 26th, 1945. The supreme fraud of 1945, a dot. The Charter of the United Nations. Two years ago in Cincinnati, we had an excellent presentation by Herb Titus. And at that time, I decided to buy a pocket United Nations Charter. And so with Amazon.com as our source, we found a, a pocket United Nations Charter in England and they sent it over to me for a mere $12. I'm now the proud owner of an original first edition. Cons uh, I keep saying constitution. It is a constitution. It's a constitution for world government. It's not a treaty, not a multipartite treaty. It was written and created as a constitution for world government. But we'll cover that in just a moment. On, in Article 110, the present charter shall be ratified by the signatory states in accordance with their respective constitutional processes. What is our constitutional process for ratifying a charter like the United Nations Charter? That's what we did. 
Is that the constitutional process? And we'll cover that here as we address the, the problem. What is our constitutional process for ratifying such a document? One, is the United Nations Charter a treaty or a constitution for world government? We need to decide that when we determine how to ratify. Two, does our constitutional process authorize the Senate to amend the Constitution by a two-thirds vote? Say it. Do it. Does it? No. no, absolutely not. Three, is the Senate empowered to pass treaties that override federal law? No, they're not empowered to do that. A Constitution for World Government is the title of this wonderful talk that Herb Titus gave two years ago out in Cincinnati. It's on my website, libertyandlearning.com. I transcribed it, and it's written out, and it's just worth your reviewing and reading. Those of you that heard it once, it's time to read it again. Two contrasting charters. July the 28th, 1945, news release. The U.S. Senate approved the United Nations Charter after a mere six days' worth of deliberations. Eighty-nine senators voted to approve it as if it were a treaty. It's not a treaty. It's a constitution for world government. But nevertheless, it was handled as a treaty, and in a mere six days, there were only two senators who stood up to their peers and voted correctly. No, on the United Nations Charter. Now, there are early precedents. I'm supposed to direct your thinking back to constitutional period. We can learn from the early precedents. I give you one example of several's that show the early thinking, the original intent of our constitutional forebearers on this topic. When North Carolina was ratifying the Constitution, now this is way back in the old days, they wrote into their a reservation in the ratification of the document. It says, quote, no treaties which shall be directly opposed to the existing laws of the United States in Congress assembled shall be valid until such laws shall be repealed or made conformable to such treaty. With other words, you can't pass a treaty that violates federal law. The second part, nor shall any treaty be valid which is contradictory to the Constitution of the United States. A two-thirds majority vote of the Senate is not sufficient to amend the Constitution. Let's take them for a moment. Let's look back at that time period, the early time period, a voluntary compact between free, sovereign, independent states was formed in 1789. And by the way, most people think America was born on the 4th of July. That's one of those myths. I don't know how many people claim that. Probably 90% of you still think that it was born on the 4th of July. Well, I tell you, you're wrong, and it's easy to show in history. When was America born? Would you believe March the 4th, 1789? Yes, that's when the Union was born, March the 4th, 1789. And most people don't have a clue as to how many states joined the Union on March the 4th, 1789 to launch this new Union. How many? Thank you. Mr. Pratt, 11, 11 states joined the Union and officially on March the 4th, 1789, they started what we now call the United States of America. Now, these sovereign independent states I've assigned to the pointer finger, they're going to point the way. Now, this is what was happening back in the 1700s. They're going to point the way. And 12 of them, not 13, but 12 of them sent delegates to a convention where they finally created, after great debate, a constitution. And that constitution then was sent back to these sovereign states to determine whether they would ratify it or not, whether they would accept it. And only 11 had accepted by the date that they officially established the United States of America. In that constitution, they divided power. It was a document of a limited and defined authority. They divided the power between the legislative, the executive, and the judicial and they called it the United States of America, born March the 4th, 1789. And whenever they used these, this, this, this phrase in a sentence, what was the correct English grammar? Is it the United States is, or is it the United States are? Up until 1861, it was is. Oh, excuse me, it was are. After 1861, it became is. Most people don't know that. A total change in the form of government took place after 1861. This is the United States today. 
We, we have this crumpled, poor-looking paper hand. The United States of America in 2008. You remember what the thumb represented? The thumb represented the Constitution. It's been crumpled. It's on the brink of ruin. It's hanging by a thread. The sovereign states were eradicated completely. They're no different now than provinces. We saw this picture of Canada on the screen a little while ago and the overbearing government in Canada. Our states are very little different than that. Now we're ruled over by a powerful central government. And what about the legislature? Well, it's shriveled. It's shriveled. And we don't have any trouble giving examples of a shriveled legislature. When's the last time they were willing to declare war? We've been at continuous war since the United Nations Charter was adopted. When was the last time the legislature declared war? 1942. I heard it out there. 1942, during World War II, is the last time. They've shriveled. When was, what was their ability to, to remove from office a liar and an adulterer who was the president of the United States and was properly impeached? Did they remove him from office? No, no they couldn't even remove this evil man from office. They shriveled. In their place, however, we have a bloated executive and a bloated judicial. And they are doing far more than any powers that were ever granted to them. And when we speak of the United States today, we use the word is. These two gentlemen will give us, uh, help us to understand the situation. Stephen Breyer is a living constitutionalist, as he calls himself. And Antonin Scalia calls himself an originalist. Well, what's this all about? Stephen Breyer declares the Constitution is a living document and must be read in the context of an ever-changing world. Wasn't well, that sweet? We're just going to rewrite it every time we have a, a gathering of the Supreme Court and whatever majority says is what the Constitution means. Now, he didn't invent that. That started with the man Earl Warren way back in the old days. Who appointed Earl Warren? Who was the President of the United States that appointed that man? Eisenhower. Eisenhower. Somebody arguing with me recently said, oh, if we just had uh, this, this man uh, from Arizona become the President, what's his name? Anybody remember? Yes, if he was the president, he would appoint conservative judges to the Supreme Court. They don't remember that he, he voted for Ruth Battist Ginberg and, and also for uh, Stephen Breyer. Yes, yes. Well, let's go on here. And to, oh, that's a dot, by the way. These are the dots that make this big picture. These are the dots. Most people think the battle is conservative versus liberal. Now, we're quoting from Antonin Scalia. Most people think the battle is conservatives versus liberals when it is actually originalist versus living constitutionalist. Yeah. Now we hear all this talk about, oh, I'm more conservative than you, or you're more liberal than I, or some garbage like that. Let's go back to the Constitution. What did you say right at the end of your talk? Everyone should what? Should what? Read the Constitution? I heard her say that. I second that amendment, or whatever. <laughs> Okay. Motion, motion. motion. Thank you. <laughs> okay, let's go on here. In the Constitution, this one that we should all read, it says in Article 6, Clause 2, This Constitution and the laws which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land. Now, what's the supreme law of the land? The Constitution, this Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof. It's not any whimsical law that Congress decides to pass or Supreme Court decides to create or the executive branch creates through executive law. It's not that. It's the laws that are made which shall be made in pursuance of the Constitution. The limited and defined powers granted to the Constitution, the laws must be made to conform to those limited and defined powers. And secondly, all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States. Does the United States give the authority to the Senate to rewrite the Constitution by a treaty process? No. Certainly not. And so this limitation on the Congress, the Senate, the House, the President, is very specific in this article. They shall become the supreme law of the land, and judges in every state shall be bound thereby. 
anything in the, and I add it in so it's clarifying it here so we don't misconstrue this, anything in the state constitutions or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. So if a state law or a state constitution is, in, is at difference with the federal law or the federal treaties, then the state law must give way to federal treaties that were passed in pursuance following the constitution. That's the original intent. We quoted this a moment ago. Read it again. It makes more sense now. No treaties which shall be directly opposed to the existing laws of the United States in Congress assembled shall be valid until such laws shall be repealed or made conformable to such treaty, nor shall any treaty be valid which is contradictory to the Constitution of the United States. There was a great senator named John Bricker who proposed the Bricker Amendment. He saw what was coming. He could see it was only shortly following the abomination of the supreme fraud of 1945 called the treaty. He saw what was happening. And so he was thinking to prevent misconstruction and abuse of the Constitution, further declaratory clauses should be added. And so he proposed a treaty. It became known as the Bricker Amendment. Excuse me, he didn't propose a treaty. He proposed an amendment. It became known as the Bricker Amendment. And he offered in two or three different formats during the early 1950s. It was a proposed constitutional amendment to limit the treaty power of the United States government. Well, now, he was a Republican, John Brooker was. Do you think he got support from the President of the United States, who was a Republican? No, absolutely not, because Eisenhower wasn't a Republican. He claimed he was. He claimed he was, but when you go back and read the history, you find out he was a devout Democrat. At least he believed the same concepts of the liberal Democrats at that time period. And when you read the U.S. News and World Report and other magazine articles from that time period, you find out that Eisenhower was all for support from cradle to grave. He was just another social do-gooder. And worse than that, when you read the book The Politician, you can get the rest of the story. I stood and watched Eisenhower do what you see on the screen. I was there. I was 12 years old. I was in Wenatchee, Washington, and he was standing at, on the caboose going through his whistle stops, and this was his standard position, and he would hold his arms out, and I was a little boy with a big button that said, I like Ike. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> I like Ike. Am I, I, like? I was a devout Republican. I, was, I knew that Eisenhower was a hero. If he didn't wear a white hat, I, you know, he probably had one. Nevertheless, Eisenhower embraced... Who's this man? Yes, Lyndon Johnson. And it's, it's, it's appropriate to show him here, hug him. Eisenhower embraced Lyndon Johnson, who was then the Senate Majority Leader, a devout Democrat. And between the two of them, the bully pulpit of the presidency and the power of the Senate Majority Leader, they barely were able to crush the Bricker Amendment by one vote. It missed passage by one vote to limit the treaty-making power to the original intent of the Constitution. John Bricker didn't succeed. He tried several times. He was never able to overcome the power of these two evil men. Yes, another dot. Now, a long train of abuses continued to circumvent the Constitution. The violation of process in passing treaties, executive agreements, executive orders, judicial legislation, continuous violation of the Tenth Amendment by Congress, presidential signing statements which go on liberally today. These and other methods were used to circumvent the Constitution. These are all dots in the big picture of what's happening in America. The World Trade Organization, a dot. Zbigniew New Brzezinski, who is Barack Obama's advisor at this point? Yes, Zbigniew New Brzezinski. Uh, What's that senator from Arizona's name? <laughs> Who did he employ as his advisor in the year 2000? Whoops. Yes, Zbigniew Brzezinski. Yes. Are there any difference between Eisenhower and Johnson? Is there any difference between the presidential candidates today? No. Zilch, no. They're both in the same party. Zbigniew Brzezinski said, we cannot leap into, the, into world government in one quick step. The precondition for eventual globalization, genuine globalization, is progressive regionalization, 
because thereby we move toward larger, more stable, more cooperative units. Now this is the teaching of the security advisor to the two presidential prospects today. Dot. NAFTA. Dot. Henry Kissinger. We ought to be a dot, but we're going to give you a quotation from him. NAFTA will represent the most creative step toward a new world order taken by any group of countries since the end of the Cold War. NAFTA is not a conventional trade agreement, but the architecture of a new international system. Now, this is an elitist top advisor to American presidents. CAFTA battle rages in Congress. My congressman, am I not correct there? I believe it was my congressman in Utah that threw the, the vote and made CAFTA pass. It was CAFTA, another dot. Security and Prosperity Partnership of North America. Eventually, our long-range objective is to establish with the United States, but also with Canada, our other regional partner, an ensemble of connections and institutions similar to those created by the European Union. Mr. Vincente Fox, another dot. The North American Union. Let's read a word from Colin Powell, who explains who, who has sovereignty. Somebody says, the sovereign United States. Nonsense. We gave our sovereignty up by a treaty? In 1945, with respect to U.S. policy, when it comes to our role as a member of the United Nations Security Council, we obvious, obviously are bound by United Nations resolutions. We're not following the Constitution of the United States. We're following United Nations resolutions. Robert Mueller, apostle of global government from UN, former U.N. Assistant Secretary General, declared, I hope that more regional communities will be created following the example of the European Union so that the United Nations can be transformed soon into a true world union. This man supports it also. Don't kid yourself. He's right in there with them. The UN Reform Act of 2005. And here, here we had House Majority Leader Tom DeLay arguing for more support, more money, more benefits to the United Nations. If and when these reforms are enacted, Mr. Speaker, the world will be safer and stronger. The American people will be assured their money is being well spent. And the United Nations Charter to prevent wars, protect human rights, and advance the cause of human freedom will be reaffirmed. That's pure propaganda. Pure nonsense. <coughs> Agenda 21 and the United Nations. Was that to prevent wars? Was it to protect human freedom? Was it to advance the cause of human, uh, of human rights? Nonsense. Another dot, a big red one. Here President Bush is submitting himself to the United Nations leadership before giving an address to them where he called for a 75,000 man United Nations army to keep the peace. Another dot. There's only one congressman, it seems, back in Washington that understands this, and each year he puts in the American Sovereignty Restoration Act, and that's Ron Paul. He understands the kind of reform that's needed in the United Nations. Thank you. That's how I feel about Ron Paul also. I was here in Texas just presenting constitutional lecture series in 1976, and Ron Paul was a brand new congressman. And he came to my lecture. It was a delightful evening. After the lecture, we went out together and had, the, had the, this great conversation. I've loved him ever since. <laughs> He's my hero, one of them, one of the many. Here, here's what he had to say about reforming the United Nations. The only true reform for the United Nations is for the U.S. to withdraw immediately. <laughs> now back on the table in the corner, there's a beautiful exhibit of magazines. This is one of them. It's, I used to be a full-time researcher. I spent days and days, you know, reading books for the, the, for, they paid me. They actually gave me money to read books and magazines, and I read them all. I read U.S. News, I read Time and Newsweek, and I read, what, the forerunner of the New American, and now the New American. And I finally concluded that you could tell a magazine's quality by the advertisements. If they advertise, just look at the back cover and see what they're advertising. Is it a beautiful woman smoking a cigarette and drinking vodka? Then don't bother to read the magazine. 
If they're gonna if they're gonna distort your body, they'll warp your mind with the content of the magazine. The New American is the finest news magazine on the market today, and I thoroughly recommend it. Here are a few of the front covers that you'll help to see some of the dots. President George Bush empowering the United Nations. Now these are front covers, these are the feature articles. What did we win? Exporting U.S. jobs. Your job may be next. China's new fortune. Engineered extinction. Who's turning up the heat? Immigration report. Wish I had an hour on each one of these. <laughs> Pushing national IDs. Corridor system. Oh, there we are. Now we're back to the start. Now does it make sense? You've got it figured out, don't you? You can see it. You can see the big picture. This picture represents the resolute wickedness of those who oppose liberty. That's what these dots are. In the excellent article in Foreign Affairs in 1974 by Richard Gardner, we read, and I, by the way, I pulled my magazine out of my briefcase to, to quote here to this evening. If instant world government is not immediately possible, what hope for progress is there? The hope for the foreseeable future lies not in building up a few ambitious central institutions of universal membership and general jurisdiction, like the United Nations. He says that's not the way we're going to do it, as was envisaged, envisaged at the end of the last war, but rather in the much more decentralized, disorderly, and pragmatic process of inventing or adapting institutions of limited jurisdiction and selected membership to deal with specific problems on a case-by-case -case basis. I read this first in 1978, just four years after he'd published in the Foreign Affairs magazine, and I was a researcher at that time, and I got my pencil out, and I started writing notes. I added to them just recently. These are my notes. These are the organizations that accomplish what he's talking about. Radical feminist organizations, plural. Radical black extremist organizations, animal rights groups, radical environmentalist groups, homosexual organizations, multiculturalist associations, People for the American Way, ACLU, National Abortion Rights Action League, Planned Parenthood, all the ABCs that we're familiar with, plus many more. These are all dots. These are all dots in the big picture of what the enemies of American freedom are trying to do to us. In short, the house of world order will have to be built from the bottom up rather than from the top down. It will look like a great booming, buzzing confusion, but an end run around national sovereignty, eroding it piece by piece, will accomplish much more than the old-fashioned frontal assault. Well, there those dots are. Have you got it figured out now? This, this next one, get ready. It will look like a great booming, buzzing confusion. Those are the dots. But an end run around national sovereignty, eroding it piece by piece, will accomplish much more than the old-fashioned frontal assault. That's what the picture is. That's the dots connected. This is the New World Order of Socialism team. They're strong. They have many prominent leaders. Who's carrying the ball right now? If we took his helmet off, who would we see? Yeah, yes, right now. And there's a, a whole bunch of hopefuls that would like to do that. A whole bunch of hopefuls that want to lead the way and, and, and be the end run, the end runners around national sovereignty. Some of them that have been in the spotlight recently. Yeah, it looks good in a uniform. <laughs> hey, trust me, these are all on the same team. Oh, that's our team. <sighs> well... This is the Restore the Constitution team. We're not done yet. We're not done yet. Give me another minute and a half. This great movie, just a few days ago, God works in a mysterious way, and my daughter-in-law brought me this movie, and it just touched my heart. Facing the Giants, created by the Sherwood Baptist Church of Albany, Georgia in 2006. Every American family should watch Facing the Giants. You've seen it? It's, it's, it's the kind of a movie that will make you say, we may be in the minority. And we may be tired and hammered, but we can win 
if we just get our priorities right. And that's what this movie is all about. Now, this, this, our team, they're getting ready now. Yeah, they got to shower and clean clothes. And you know, if you look close at this man's face, I think you'll recognize who it is. <laughs> One of many great team members. I just recently had this book handed to me. I read it. I love the contents. Restore the Constitution is his theme. And the very last sentence in a peaceful revolution is, let the revolution begin. Now, he's not the only team member. There are some other great team members. Ten days ago, I hosted in Utah for a series of speeches. A wonderful man. See if you recognize this one. Anybody know who that is? Yeah. Chuck Baldwin from Pensacola, Florida. Pastor of the Four Square Baptist Church and a wonderful, wonderful American. Now, do you recognize this one? These are some of the great heroes on our team. Give a hand to him. Yes. Bless their hearts. How about this one? This is one of my favorites. <laughs> I love this dear woman. I was just a young speaker and a young researcher when I first met her and she came to speak in Utah and she inspired me then and she has ever since. She looks good in a uniform, really does. Now, this is one of my heroes today. Do you recognize him? He's sitting right there on the front row. He's 88 years old. And I've never known anyone with such stamina and endurance as Bert Smith. Thank you, Bert. Thank you. Those are you. These are us. That's our team. Each of your pictures could go up there if I had a picture of you. Oh, you know what that is, don't you? Yeah, that's an actual photograph. An actual photograph of a couch potato. You all know people like this. They're wonderful people. They're filled with faith and virtue. They give you the shirt off their back. They're kind. They bring you the loaf of bread when you move in and the, the, bar, the, the bottle of fruit. And yet they haven't taken an interest at this point in preserving freedom. Now there are many of them. <laughs> and you and I have a duty to perform. We have a duty to perform. We learn from the Holy Scriptures my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So it's our duty to share with, with happiness, not in a sour doomsayer way, but with happiness and enthusiasm. Share the great message of freedom. Hear ye, hear ye, restore the Constitution. <laughs> this is our message. We need to add knowledge to our faith and virtue. And we can do that by starting by reading the document itself. Restore the Constitution. Oh, we're getting down to the end now. This is my small effort, Stephen Pratt's small effort. Go to my website, libertyandlearning.com, and you can see the, the itsy-bitty effort we're trying up in our part of the country to restore the Constitution. Constitution. This beautiful book, last year we talked about it here. We've sold 10,000 since we saw you last. There's a stack of them on the table. Please get your nose into the book and find out what our early founders believed. One of the great beliefs coming from that book, the only reliable basis for sound government and just human relations is natural law. There's another great book back on the table, Betrayed by the Bench. Understanding where we once were and how we have gotten to where we are today can be used to bring America back to again being truly one nation under God. And then this beautiful and inspirational book by Roy Moore, So Help Me God, his closing statement is, there is indeed a cause, and God is waiting for his people to stand in faith, to let their light shine in the darkness that threatens to engulf us. Can he count on you? And there's a picture of you. Actually, it is you and me. Can he count on you? Now, we have a duty to perform. One million. This is the duty to get one million people to read this by November. Now, we can do it. We can do it. There are 700 of them on the table back here. 700. They will fit in your suitcase. Shove your underwear over and find a place. <laughs> Gasoline went up. Food went up. Gold went up. Silver went up. Everything's going up except for the Constitution. It's going down. It's spiraling down because somebody donated all the paper. 
to print a million copies. And so we have a million copies available. 100 copies for $30. Have you ever heard of a bargain like that? I want seven people right now to raise their hand, take 100 copies home for $30. You got them out there, Zelda? Memorize their hands. Check their fingerprints. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Those of you, thank you. Those, those of you that would like to, to order them, we will hold that price until we've sold the million. Now, we already sold a million and a half. So trust me, this million will go, and we intend to have them sold by November. A million people to read the Constitution. You can find ways to get rid of hundreds of them. Two weeks ago, I was invited by my pastor to come into the church and give a patriotic presentation, and I asked for permission to lay 400 of them out on the table in the hall. And I, I offered to the membership of the congregation about 400 adults and children. I says, anybody wants one, take it home. 300 plus disappeared from the table. And the next day I saw the neighbor girl walking along, carrying it. A 10-year-old girl picked it up off the table in the church. And I said to her, what you doing? Huh? It was pretty obvious what she's doing. She says, I'm memorizing the, the Declaration of Independence. And then she quoted the first paragraph to me. We need to raise up a generation of children that love the Constitution. And somehow we've got to get it into their hands. So take it seriously. That's my message. Thank you for being tolerant. Thank you.